Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew Sumner, and today we've got a very special guest, California's finest, Stephanie Garber. How are you, Stephanie? I'm great. I'm happy to be here. How are you doing? I, I am also great, and I am also happy to be here, primarily because, as you know, and as I'm about to tell the, the viewers, we're massive fans of your Caraval series here at Forbidden Planet. So um, after that epic trilogy, um, we're now here to talk about your new book, Once Upon a Broken Heart. What can you tell me about it, Stephanie? So Once Upon a Broken Heart is the first book in a brand new series. It's set in the same universe as Caraval, but it is not a continuation of the story. So while there might be small cameos from Caraval characters, you do not need to read the Caraval series to jump into Once Upon a Broken Heart. This is an all new story about love and curses and the lengths that people will go to for a happily ever after. Evangeline Fox, our new protagonist, is a girl who grew up in a curiosity shop believing in fairy tales and happily ever after, but she questions everything when the love of her life gets engaged to another. Believing he's cursed, she makes a deal with the charismatic but wicked Prince of Hearts. He says that he'll, he'll stop the wedding in exchange for three kisses. However, after her first promised kiss, Evangeline realizes that making a bargain with an immortal is not really a good idea and that the Prince of Hearts wants more from her than she's pledged. Wow, that, that is a pitch and a half. That's amazing. Now, now you, may, you don't know this, but I do, which is our, our head book buyer at Forbidden Planet. The mighty Laura Dodd is a huge fan of your work and is a huge fan of the book. Oh! Yeah. Which, that, by the way, for everybody watching, you can order from the links attached to this conversation. That makes me so happy. And I actually have a funny Forbidden Planet story. Oh, um, yeah. I've never, I've never told anyone, because um, I, I went to Forbidden Planet one time. The one time I was in London, and it was a very, it was for Caraval, and I had um, done a signing somewhere else, and another author took me around to all the different bookstores, and she took me to Forbidden Planet, which was amazing. And it was really busy in there. And I, this is like really out of character for me. I was like shy that my book had just come out and she's like, oh, well, we can't find any employees. She's like, just sign the books. Cause there were copies of Caravel <laughs> there. And so I just signed the books that were on the shelf and put them back and didn't tell anyone. And I remember feeling like such a rubble. Cause I was like, oh, I just went in this bookstore and wrote in their books. <laughs> But I did like a sly secret signing in a Forbidden Planet one time. So you have just sold the years long mystery of the stealth Stephanie Garber book signing. And I'm <laughs> glad that you're here to tell everybody about it in real time. That, that is amazing. So so your entire universe, your Carol, your Caraval universe, if you will. Where did that come from within you? Where, where, how, how did you get upon the road to creating this this vivid universe? Ooh, so it really started. So Caraval was the first book that I published, but it was the, to kind of count in my head, the sixth book that I'd written. And the book I'd written before that didn't get published was a space opera. And so but it really was very, very different. Yes, it was very different. And it was very bleak and very gritty and dark. You know, these like very sleek spaceships and cannibal planets and just really not me. Um, even though I enjoy reading that stuff, I don't think it was quite me as a writer. And I remember going into the next book and I knew I wanted to write about this game. And I was watching a Boz Lerman movie. I was watching The Great Gatsby. I'm a big fan of his films. And it was that scene that I think everybody knows where Leonardo DiCaprio has the champagne coupe and there are fireworks in the background and dancers and sparkles. And I remember feeling like, this is the kind of story I want to tell. This is, this is the world I want to create. And so when I first started writing, I went in with this idea that I was like, I'm just going to write everything colorful and it's going to be big and it's going to be slightly over the top. And that was how I started with the universe. And when I moved on for this book, since it takes a different pl place in a different part of the Caraval world, I, I knew I wanted to have that same big feel but where Caravelle was all games and it kind of has this carnival feel to it, I wanted this part of the world to be fairy tales. I wanted it to feel like 
old world magic. Like you're stepping inside of a fairy tale and, you know, around any corner, you might see any manner of fairy tale being. And there's kind of magic everywhere that touches everything and maybe not in big, bold strokes like Caraval, but in subtle, subtle things like little tiny dragons, like instead of squirrels that roam the docks and, you know, perch on your shoulders and things like that. So I, it, it really just started with that film and just this idea of like, this is, this is the type of world I want to spend time in. I want to be transported to magical places when I read um, that are beautiful, but also like a little deadly and you might die, but it's okay. Cause it's really pretty. I, I think that's a, a supremely evocative reference that you've used because I think it, it everybody who's seen that film, which is, is many people, but if you've seen the Baz Luhrmann, Great Gatsby, and I, I'm a great fan of the novel, but I love his version of, 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 I love his adaptation of the novel. But that moment that you're talking about, I think I've worn that meme out in a congratulations emails over the last decade because it immediately encapsulates uh, an entire feeling, an entire sense of place. I know exactly what you mean, because in that moment where the Leonardo Gatsby is holding a champagne glass up and the fireworks go off, when you're watching it, you're just like, man, I want to be there. I want to be in that moment. Yes, exactly. And I feel like for me, the books I love the most are always the ones that I feel like transport me to a place that I believe could be real that feels so specific that as soon as i open the pages it's like i'm there i know exactly where i am yeah and i i think i think that's something you captured in your writing with that that sort of sense of almost um sometimes i hope this makes sense to you a kind of like day glow wide widescreen kind of day glow sensibility uh, it, it, in a way it, uh, it the cut the colors of what you're doing kind of the emotional colors of it jump off the page Oh, thank you. I'm I'm really glad. <laughs> and it, what what have been? The, what would you say on your road to to becoming Stephanie Garber author? Um, who who? Uh, which other authors have been the most uh, influential upon you? Oh wow! I mean, I think there are a lot of authors before I was published. I, I mean, and even after I was published right now, it's hard to like remember going anywhere. I would go, I would go to a lot of book signings. Um, at I, I usually say it's my local independent bookstore, even though it's about like two and a half hours away. Yeah. Um, and I would listen to authors and I would read, I would go to conferences and listen to authors and go to workshops and I would, you know, read blog posts because I started writing in the big days of blogging. And I think, I think there are authors who are influential in different ways. There are authors whose work inspired me. Um, one of the authors that comes to mind is Lainey Taylor. I love her work because her world building is just yeah. so visceral and it's so imaginative. And that was one of her writing was something that really inspired me in just realizing like I can spend time in my world. I think I'd been reading a lot of books that were sparser and really quick and plotty, which I love, but her writing really showed me like, it's okay to slow down and create a big world. And um, she has just amazing creatures and amazing things that she does that are super unexpected. And I feel like reading her books gave me permission to be unexpected. Um, and then another book on like the more like another author on the more emotional side is Robin Lefevers. She writes books about assassin nuns. Yeah. And I remember reading one of her blog posts before I was published. And she was talking about the parts of a story and the publishing journey and saying, you know, that if you, if you're a writer and you're at that spot where it feels the most hopeless where it feels bleak, where it is really that darkest moment that happens in every single book, that that's probably the same place with your life. Like that's where you are, that it's not the end. It just feels like the end, that it's not the darkest moment, that it's just the spot before you have to rally what's inside you to get to the finish line. And I remember being so encouraged by that and feeling like all the rejection that I was receiving at that time 
wasn't true rejection. It was just part of the journey. It was something that everybody has to go on. And we all have to have that darkest moment, it, not just in our books, but kind of in our lives and our journeys. And so I found, I remember that post specifically, but I read a lot of her just blog posts at the time. So encouraging and so inspiring to just keep going. I, I, I That's very interesting to hear you say that, because I think one of the things that's very laudable about your approach is that uh, a I think you're a, a classic walking example of how perseverance is the key in in any field you know if you're if you any creative field any field in life if you're a performer you know if you're if, if you're an actor a musician you've got to go to a lot of interviews you have to keep on plugging away but but also um, on your website I love the fact that you have so much advice for other people who are taking that journey towards becoming becoming a writer you're giving back something to other people within your profession. Oh, thank you. I forget even what's on that because I haven't updated my website in so long. But I I think, you know, when I first did it, I I had spent so much time as a writer learning and I really I learned from other authors. I I, you know, I didn't go to school to learn how to write. And so I feel like it is such an important part of the community that, you know, if everyone just keeps giving to each other, it work it works out well. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think it's true. I think it's tremendously important. And what's next for your Caraval universe? Um, there is a second book. There is a sequel to Once Upon a Broken Heart coming out. I almost just said the title, um, which would be, I'd be in a lot yeah, of trouble they, they, for. Your marketing <laughs> teams, PR teams, they don't like it when you spill the beans, do they? No, but we have plans to share it this winter um, or this fall, I suppose, this fall. It's not like too far out, but yeah. So I'm working on edits for that book. It's written, it's just in edits. We're working on covers. So um, that will be coming out. I can't say when. In. I like have all this information, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, so I'm working, um, I'm working on that and I'm really, really excited about it. I, with the Caravel series, each book, I didn't know if there was going to be another book when I wrote it. Um, and this series, I, I, when I wrote the first book, I knew where I was going with the second book. So it feels very much like a big continuation of this story. And I'm so, I'm really excited to like be able to share more about it. Uh, well, we we really can't we really can't wait. I can't wait to hear what the uh, what the what the next title is is, is going to be, and uh, and again, I, I've had the pleasure of chatting to Stephanie about our latest book, Once Upon a Broken Heart, which you can order from the links attached to this conversation. And Stephanie, before we part, another question I've got for you, a final question, if you will, that I called once again from having a look at your website was. Did you ever make it or have you made it yet to Club 33 at Disneyland? I have not. I have not. I am still telling everyone I come across that I really want to in hopes that someone will give me a magic golden ticket. Yeah. Um, but no, it hasn't. It hasn't happened. I had plans to go there um, for my birthday last year. Not Club 33, but just go to yeah. Disneyland um, right before the world shut down. So I'm hoping to at least like make it back to Disneyland within the next year. And if some miracle happens and some Disney fairy wants to give me a ticket to Club 33, my life would be complete. Yeah, well, I, I really, I'm sure that you will get that experience. And by the way, I should say, because I'll tell you something, mate, I have been to Club 33. <gasps> You uh, have? And, yeah, because I'm English, I didn't know what it was. And I didn't really know the full relevance of it or what a treat it was until I was in the middle of it, you know, because a friend of mine who works in the uh, the movie business is a member there. And he was like, oh, I'm going to take you here. I was like, oh, it's OK, mate. I've, I've been to Disneyland. I mean, <laughs> let's, you know, let's go somewhere else. You know? and he's like, no, no, you want to see this. I didn't even know. I didn't even know what it was. And it, it was like, I don't know, walking in, walking through Diagon Alley or something. It was suddenly, oh, man, I mean, I know all about it now. But at the time, I had no idea. Because, you know, if you grow up in the UK, a lot of this Disneyland mythology doesn't make its way over the Atlantic. Everybody thinks they know about Disneyland. But, yeah, it's an exclusive club, essentially, founded by Walt Disney inside Disneyland itself, right? And I can't think of anybody who's better suited to being there than you. I wish I could go back in time and give you my invitation so you could have experienced it. But it makes me glad you're the only the second person I've ever talked to who's ever been. And the first person was the person who told me about it. 
Um, I felt my mind was blown as someone who grown up in California going to Disneyland. And I was like, how did I not know this existed? And now every time I go, I walk by that 33, you know, right right by the exit to Pirates of the Caribbean. And I'm just like, someday, someday. I think I've knocked on the door, you know, taking pictures, but nobody's been like, hey, come in. (laughs) I'm glad you got to go. It gives me hope. And I know, I know for a fact that you will go. And I also know for a fact that the, the next book in the in the Caraval series or the Caraval adjacent series is going to be wonderful, as is Once Upon a Broken Heart, recommended by not, none other than the great Laura Dodd from Forbidden Planet, available right here at the links attached to this conversation. Stephanie, it's been such a pleasure chatting with you, mate. You too. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day. It was lovely to talk to you. And I hope you have a fabulous weekend. Thank you. The very same to you. And come back and tell us about the next book as well. I totally will. Thank you. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.